Why are Wagner mercenaries allegedly flying into Polish airspace? What are the results on the battlefield of those new American cluster munitions sent to Ukrainian forces? Is the counteroffensive really going to grind to a stalemate? And is Ukraine striking Moscow with attack drones? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's analyze that. The US government recently provided Ukraine with what's called cluster bombs that can be fired from artillery shells, rockets, or air delivered. Cluster bombs are designed to release explosive submunitions, each weighing less than 20 kilograms or about two pounds. They're like powerful hand grenades and they blanket a giant wide area about the size of a few football stadiums. They're nicknamed grid killers because they take out an entire one by one kilometer grid square. The standard US submunition is called dual purpose improved conventional munition, meaning it affects both vehicles and personnel. But the reality of the situation is that these are best used in anti-personnel roles against soft targets. They're not that effective against armored vehicles in most cases. The majority of cluster bombs are high explosive, not shape charged. So they likely wouldn't do much against the tank. But why is this weapon so controversial? It's outlawed in 123 countries around the world because the official dud rate for these submunitions is 2.35%. Most drop about 400 of these little bomblets. So in that case, we're talking about at least eight unexploded munitions in each cluster bomb. To make matters worse, a lot of these munitions look like baseballs or cricket ball shaped. They almost look like badminton toys or like lawn darts. They even have strings coming off them and they can be brightly colored, so curious people are inclined to just pick them up and they oftentimes detonate when that happens. To be clear, all weapons are dangerous against civilians. All weapons of war are horrific, but these are considered by the international community to be especially so. The Russian army has already used cluster bombs against Ukraine throughout the war. Human Rights Watch found at least 16 credible cases of weapons used by Russian forces. The United Nations found 24 instances. Although you might be surprised to learn Ukraine has already used them before. Allegedly, they used cluster bombs in 2014. We hear all the time that these things have a high dud rate. But what does that really mean? Why is that the case? Well, they often land at the wrong angle. So what happens is the fuse doesn't function and they don't detonate when they're supposed to. The dud rate numbers vary widely, like really widely. The numbers range from 2% to 40% of them don't work. Could you make that ballpark estimate any bigger? The United States, Russia, and Ukraine haven't signed on to this agreement to ban cluster bombs, but the US did stop producing them and worked to eliminate and destroy old stockpiles and variants starting in 2008. Munitions used after 2018 allegedly have a dud rate of less than 1%. Ethics aside though, what effects are they having on the front lines in Ukraine? They started using them in mid-July, and very quickly we started to hear results by July 20th. This isn't like the tanks and armored vehicles that were sent. These don't need a ton of training. They were sent very quickly, and they were used even quicker. National Security Spokesman for the United States, John Kirby, said that they were being used effectively on Russian defensive positions and operations. The reason cluster bombs could make a difference on the front line because they're specifically useful to target trench lines which are difficult to land traditional artillery into. So for instance, a trench is about one meter or three to six feet wide, which makes it very difficult to land a precision artillery round in there. Traditional 155 millimeter artillery have a circular error probability of at least 16 feet. That means it's very tough to hit that narrow of a target without cluster bombs. There's not much room for error with a single shot. With cluster munitions, on the other hand, there's a greater chance of one of those bomblets falling into and clearing trenches or defensive positions out. Here's a quote from a Ukrainian infantryman who had cluster bombs used in his area of operations. He said, quote, even if you miss a little, it works. With the cluster bombs, you fire three times and the trees totally collapse. Also saying, quote, these will really knock out artillery as long as they can reach it. So its effectiveness so far has also been to bring down that high brush, make it catch fire, so Russia's defensive positions become more exposed and difficult to hide in. It wipes out trees and cover. Everything above waist height is cut apart, which is something we don't normally think about with this type of weapon. But we have to remember for every action, there's also a reaction on the battlefield. If Russian soldiers were vulnerable to this type of attack before, you can be sure that they're gonna create new tactics and procedures to limit that vulnerability. I'm sure you've seen some of the photos and videos. The Russian trenches can be seven feet deep. 
but they can be adjusted by creating more overhead cover, some plywood and dirt can help mitigate from these smaller cluster bombs, for instance. Russian troops will also adapt and spread their soldiers more thinly across defensive lines, which will make them a harder target, but also make it more difficult for them to mass fire on Ukrainian positions. These first ground accounts came from the Wall Street Journal that published a report on a Ukrainian infantryman platoon that was pinned down taking heavy fire around the village of Robotin, southeast of Zaporizhia city. The Ukrainian soldiers radioed stating that they were trying to fall back and withdrawal to safety, but the commander told the platoon to take cover instead. Danger close cluster bombs flew overhead, striking the Russian position. First hand accounts from Ukrainian troops on the ground say it sounded like rain overhead. Then they heard chaos on the Russian radio channels that they were monitoring. This allowed the Ukrainian platoon that was pinned down before to instead move forward to capture that Russian position. This gives us some early indication about the cluster bomb's effectiveness. Cards on the table, I'm biased towards Ukraine, so of course I'm gonna find stories that are positive, I'm gonna be drawn to that. I encourage you to look at a wide range of sources. When you look at pro-Russian sources and pro-Ukrainian sources, both sides are claiming that this cluster bomb is not gonna be a game changer. It can be tempting to say that this is the weapon that's gonna turn the tide now, but that's not necessarily the case here. Shortly after Ukraine began using new American-supplied cluster munitions, there started to be strange movements on Poland's border with Belarus. This is when we saw the Russian Wagner mercenary group had a notable breach of Polish airspace. I'm sure no one out there had a Wagner mercenaries messing around on the Polish border with Belarus on their bingo card two months ago, so how did we get here? Well, after the failed Wagner coup, the mercenary group's leader, Prigozhin, was exiled to Belarus. Each pardoned Wagner member faced an important choice at that point, to accompany Prigozhin to his new camp in Belarus at SEAL, or to enlist in the Russian army as regular soldiers. Sounds like two not-so-great choices. Belarusian defense minister announced in July a roadmap for Wagner and how they would actually be used in his country for, quote, training and transfer of experience between units of different branches of the armed forces. The Polish government, on the other hand, wasn't having any of this. They announced they would boost security at the border while stating there's no reason to panic. Here's the thing, though. Cross-border tension here is nothing new. Poland and Belarus have been at it for years. Belarus has a history of sending large numbers of thousands of immigrants and refugees from the Middle East to the border with Poland and using that to pressure them. Poland's government has actually accused Russia and Belarus of using the migrants to destabilize their country. These are what's called hybrid attacks. This concept refers to any kind of attack that isn't bullets and bombs, but I like to call them passive-aggressive warfare. Passive-aggressive warfare, or microaggression warfare, is, it's, it's kind of necessary in the atomic weapons age, since we can no longer hash things out on large land wars because that risks ending the world today, so we have to resort to strange, underhanded attacks. Then, usually one side or the other will deny it ever happened, and we all kind of end up feeling like we're being gaslit by nation states. So the tensions at the border are even worse now that Wagner mercenaries are in the mix. On July 20th, media reports showed Wagner conducting joint training exercises with Belarusian special forces at Brest training grounds. This location is only three kilometers away from the Polish border. This is technically not being aggressive, and technically not aggressive is the best kind of not aggressive. It's what really is called posturing, because on August 1st, the situation seemed to deteriorate when Belarusian President Lukashenko taunted Warsaw. He said that Poland should in fact be thankful for him keeping Wagner forces in check. He also said to Putin in an interview that Wagner forces were eager to, quote, go on an excursion to Warsaw. An excursion, like it's a picnic or a vacation in Warsaw to try out the pierogies. These were seen as fighting words because on July 29th, the Polish prime minister stated, the situation is becoming even more dangerous. We have information that more than 100 mercenaries of the Wagner group have moved towards the Swalki Gap near Hundra in Belarus. The Swalki Gap is a sparsely populated area immediately southwest of the border between Lithuania and Poland. It's considered one of the most likely locations where any kind of land attack could potentially occur. The Polish Prime Minister insisted that relocating Wagner forces to the Gap marks a step towards what's called hybrid attack on Polish territory. The situation escalated to an apex on August 1st, when Warsaw declared there'd been a startling breach in its airspace. 
The breach involved two Belarusian military helicopters, operating at low altitudes to avoid radar. The Belarus helicopters flew about four kilometers deep into Polish territory. They then rapidly returned back home. I've got the most full-blown case of NATO blue balls at this point from all this tension. I think what Poland's really worried about here is that the Wagner forces are gonna cosplay as immigrants, come over the border, and get into all kinds of tomfoolery and start all kinds of instability in their country. It's interesting to note how the US government's language has shifted over this. A UN ambassador stated that any attack by Wagner forces will constitute an attack by the Russian government. So this could invoke NATO's Article 5 if Wagner forces start any trouble on Poland's border. Belarus, of course, did the gaslighting thing I was talking about earlier and said, no, we didn't dip into Polish airspace. They accused Poland of fabricating these accusations. They said that Poland is using this as a pretext for a troop escalation. Belarus, the defense minister said Poland was just doing this because of their quote unquote overseas masters, alluding to the United States. On face value, the comment is really interesting though, when you consider the fact that Belarus is pretty subservient to Russia. Onet, a prominent Polish media outlet, compiled a list of potential explanations for the recent maneuvers, stating Belarus may be merely provoking Poland with the intent to create confusion. Or most likely they're meant to destabilize the situation in Poland, because Poland is currently dealing with some dissent in their population. 500,000 people protested the government in June, claiming it was headed in an anti-democracy direction. There are some reasons why Russia would be really interested in creating chaos in Poland right now. Because if you've been following the news, you may have heard about long range attacks recently. Ukraine is striking much deeper into Russian rear areas and incorporating maritime targets for kind of the first time. Moscow was even hit with drones allegedly from Ukraine. Throughout July, there have been at least three separate drone attacks on Moscow. And while damage has been minimal, some strikes have come within blocks of striking key military facilities. For example, July 30th, three drones were launched at Moscow. One of the drones were intercepted, but it still struck an office building. The other two were taken out by Russia's air defense systems. This is according to the Russian Ministry of Defense. While Ukraine's security policy tends to mean that Kyiv does not take responsibility for attacks on Russian soil, President Zelensky kind of had a change in his approach here where he did hint to why these attacks were being conducted. In a recent nightly video address, he said gradually the war is returning to the territory of Russia, to its symbolic centers and military bases. And this is inevitable, natural, and absolutely fair process. The importance of these strikes was later highlighted by a Ukrainian Air Force spokesman who said that the drone strikes have finally made the Russian people confront the consequences of their country's involvement in the war in Ukraine. The attacks on Moscow are likely aimed to make Russian citizens think, oh dang, this war is real and it's affecting me. The hope from Ukraine's point of view is that this will make these citizens become disillusioned with the war. Ukrainian made beaver drones look like the favored drone for strikes inside of Russia. A recent drone attack struck an oil tanker that was supposedly carrying fuel for Russian forces. This shows Ukraine is increasing their arsenal of loitering munitions to conduct attacks that they were originally hesitant to do early in the war. On August 6, Ukraine, for instance, they struck two bridges in Crimea with allegedly 12 missiles, collapsing a section, causing Russian forces to reroute road traffic from shorter eastern routes to longer western routes. Russian air defenses claimed to intercept nine of those missiles. Russian sources are saying that UK provided Storm Shadow cruise missiles were used in the attack. This will be a major bottleneck in Russian ground lines of communication and will cause significant disruption to their logistics in that area. It is unclear how quickly Russian officials will be able to repair the bridge. Analysts claim this attack is setting conditions for a possible offensive push in the Kherson direction. While everyone has been focused on the Russian Sorovinkin line that we'll talk about in a second, there's a possibility of an offensive push in Kherson that might occur instead. One Russian millbogger noted that Russian defenses on the west bank of Kherson Oblast broke down in a matter of days following months of Ukrainian strikes on Russian logistics, and he expressed concern that the situation could repeat itself. More evidence of this comes from Ukraine's recent increasing strikes against Russia's naval assets. They're reaching out and touching Russia's Black Sea ports now. The theory is that these attacks are attempts to set conditions for a future ground offensive. For example, a Ukrainian naval drone struck what was called the Russian Orogaski Gornov, which is a Rapucha-class landing ship. I apologize if I said that wrong, but on the night of August 3rd to 4th, this ship was being used to ferry trips and equipment to Kherson region. 
Especially with bridges being knocked out, there's increasing ground traffic jams, and this water route was an important secondary logistics route for Russian forces that's now been cut off. But the main effort of Ukraine's offensive is smashing up against what's called the Russian Soravinkin Line. The Soravinkin Line is about 70 miles of Russian defensive positions. It's a layered ground defense. According to the CSIS think tank, Russian fortifications consist of an extensive network of trenches, anti-personnel and anti-vehicle mines, razor wire, earthen berms, and dragon's teeth truncated pyramids made of reinforced concrete used to impede the mobility of main battle tanks and mechanized infantry. These are meticulously arranged in a zigzag pattern, forming tactical kill zones that facilitate mutual fire support across the interconnected trenches. One UK intelligence report concluded that Russia had constructed some of the most expensive and extensive systems of military defensive works seen anywhere in the world for many decades. The challenge transcends the mere robustness of the defensive lines, encompassing the depth of these lines as well which poses a hurdle for Ukraine's capacity to capitalize on breakthroughs as the potential gains after breaching that first line risk becoming curtailed upon reaching the second line. There's also Russian artillery about 20 or 30 kilometers behind the defensive line providing covering fire. This interactive map created by the Institute for the Study of War demonstrates Russia's expansive defensive network. It also shows that for much of the front, Ukraine has still not reached Russia's first defensive line. Most recently, Ukraine recaptured Staromorsk on July 27th amid a stiff Russian defense. A 29-year-old Ukrainian soldier going by the call sign Bulat recalled the battle. Quote, The Russians were waiting for us. They fired anti-tank weapons and grenade launchers at us. My vehicle drove over an anti-tank mine, but everything was okay. The vehicle took the hit and everyone was alive. We dismounted and ran towards the cover. Unlike the reporting on the war so far, which would see some wide swings in territory because neither side had really set up prepared defensive lines at, at various points. So what we're looking at now is we're looking for news of a breakthrough. That's the real signal to look for because a breakthrough in the Russian Sorovinkin defensive line could mean a straight shot to Melitopol, cut off of the land bridge. There is debate about how well set up the next Russian defensive lines are. At this point in the war, Ukraine has now reclaimed over 50% of the territory occupied by Russia. As tensions surge and a long-anticipated summer offensive gains momentum, Moscow and Kyiv face a host of new challenges. The Russian attempt to coordinate their own offensive has gone largely unreported in the northeast city of Kremenea. The Russian offensive here is likely designed to draw Ukrainian resources away from the main push. If the recent estimates from Kyiv Independent are to be trusted, then this attack is tying up as much as half of the local forces. In Bakhmut on July 10th, Ukrainian forces managed to seize vital high ground to the south of the city. However, despite some notable advances, Ukraine's current progress has fallen short of the expectations held by many in the West, who may have expected advances to match those of the rapid Kherson offensive last year. One potential reason for this slowdown is the hot and rainy weather this summer has made the ground boggy and pushed up lush undergrowth. This makes it easier for Russian forces to conceal themselves and launch ambushes, while at the same time making it significantly more difficult for Ukrainian armored vehicles to traverse the territory. Once the front lines solidify, what's really important to pay attention to is for news of a breakthrough. For example, so far Ukraine has only advanced a distance of about 8 kilometers in the southeast, where Zaporizhia meets Donetsk Oblast. Here, Ukraine is pressing gradually, advancing through one hard-fought village at a time. Although it's true the offensive has been slow, it's not all doom and gloom for Ukraine. Notably, Ukraine's artillery has been performing exceptionally well. Forbes reported that Ukrainian guns are knocking out three Russian guns for every one Ukrainian gun that the Russians knock out. These successes can largely be attributed to Ukraine's growing arsenal of Western howitzers and precision-guided munitions, aided by intelligence from Ukrainian drones and presumably distant NATO intelligence assets. But an important thing to look at is the recent strikes on Ukrainian drone facilities that threaten to increase world hunger, especially in Africa. Like it's a coincidence that all these violence and coups in Africa right now is happening when 40 million people there are hungry, food insecure because of this conflict. What is a little surprising and strange is that these countries in Africa are often choosing to side with Russia instead of the West. The website Security Outlines has a really good explanation for why this difficult to square away reality is happening. 
because while this might be difficult to understand from the position of Western democracies, states suffering from internal security problems and existential threats just try to keep their options open, so they don't necessarily want to alienate Russia and they don't want to alienate the West, because they need help. The Black Sea Grain Initiative was a deal brokered between Russia, Ukraine, United States, and Turkey. It allowed Ukrainian grain back on the international market this deal. Food prices fell significantly and stopped a global food crisis. By July 2023, the price of wheat had fallen by about 17% since the start of the year, with corn prices dropping by about 26%. The International Rescue Committee had since described the deal as a lifeline for the 79 countries and 349 million people on the front lines of food insecurity, many of them in African nations. As you know, there's a lot of unrest happening in Africa right now where a lot of democracies are being overthrown by coups. Maybe it's related to the increased economic pressure happening here. Yet, pretty much immediately after the deal was signed, Russia began to question it as Russia reported an insufficient boost to Russian food and fertilizer exports, Moscow began to reason that the deal was solely implemented for the benefit of Ukraine. So basically this deal worked out for Ukraine, but not so much for Russia. This is because most shipping and insurance companies simply didn't want to engage in business with Russia, severely impacting its export potential. The deal has since ended and wheat prices have again skyrocketed nearly 10%. Russia's been bombing Ukrainian grain storage facilities with drone attacks. Satellite imagery shows the devastation of the attacks with silos, hangars, and other vital port infrastructure damaged. These attacks may be a response to Ukraine striking the Russian vital supply route on the Kerch Bridge from Crimea. There's still some hope that Turkey's President Erdogan may be able to bridge the gap and renew the grain export deal. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for hitting the like and subscribe button. And if you believe you have free will, then you'll like having the option of watching this video or this one next. The choice is yours.